Well, I'm really very, very glad to be uh, speaking at Warwick University after I was initially barred by the student union because they absurdly stated that I was highly inflammatory and could incite hatred on campus. The student union has graciously since apologized. Thanks to pressure from Benjamin David, the Warwick uh, uh, student Union, the Student Society, Atheist, Humanist and Secular Society, as well as, of course, many of you. Um, so here we are. Conflating uh, criticism of Islam, which is, of course, an idea or a religion, and Islamism, which is the religious right wing, it's a political movement with state power, with bigotry against Muslims, who are people like any other, is nothing new. Uh, now, this conflation um, has led to a disturbing trend towards censorship of much needed criticism of Islam and Islamism on university campuses. The days when unconditional free expression were championed by universities as a cornerstone of all rights is long gone. It's no longer unconditional free expression that's seen to be intrinsically good and progressive but a defense of censorship and self-censorship. Of course, as the writer Kinan Malik says, no one puts it that way. No one says that they're pro-censorship, not even uh, the most heinous regimes. I believe in free speech, but may well be a motto of our times, says Malik. I believe in free speech, but not if it undermines security, not if it's gratuitously offensive, not if it's provocative or inflammatory, Islamophobic, discriminatory, or has the potential to insult and hurt sensibilities or incite hatred. All things which, by the way, I have been accused of. In particular, criticism of Islam and Islamism is seen to be so harmful as to be equated with bigotry against Muslims. Though, of course, this is not the case, just as criticism of Christianity or Britain first is not bigotry against Christians. Postmodernists such as the Guardian's David Shariat Madari or the Labour Party's Seamus Milne consider criticism of Islam as antisocial and even dangerous. Something, by the way, I have also heard from their Ayatollah friends in Iran, as well as regimes from Saudi Arabia to Pakistan. In my opinion, criticism of Islam is deemed dangerous not because of some patronizing concern for minorities, but because in the age of ISIS, it subverts and challenges the sacred, which has always been a tool for the control of society in the interests of the dominant class under the guise of defending public sensibilities and public morality. Criticism of Islam challenges religion in political power and opens the space for dissent where none is permissible or acceptable. Ironically, critics of religion have never been free to express themselves. Yet we are the ones who are deemed harmful and inciting hatred, when in fact it's the opposite. It's the blasphemers and apostates of all ages who have faced persecution throughout. Clerics and the religious right wing have always been free to promote religion, any religion. And religion has always had a privileged position in societies, and even more so where it has influence or is in the state or is in power, Britain included. Clearly, freedom of expression without the right to criticize religion is meaningless. Such criticism has been key for social progress, and historically, it's been linked intrinsically with anti-clericalism. And it's the same today. Criticism of Islam and the state are analogous in many places like Saudi Arabia, the Islamic State, or Iran, where anything from demanding women's equality or trade union rights to condemning sexual jihad or the so-called Islamic Cultural Revolution, which has banned books and purified education, can be met with arrest, imprisonment, and even the death penalty. This is a drawing by Doa Al Adl. She's a hijabi Egyptian woman who opposes the Islamists in Egypt. 
Of course, there is a distinction between Islam as a belief versus Islamism as a far-right political movement. But the problem is that Islam is not just a belief. If it were, we would most likely not be having this discussion. It plays a political role in the form of laws and policies and as states and extreme right political movements. When the religious right are in power, religion is at the center of the struggle for change, says Iranian Marxist Hami Tahoui. If you want to defend equality between women and men, if you want to put an end to male guardianship rules, you will inevitably come face to face with religion. You want gay rights? You want the right to organize first May Day rallies and the right to strike? You will eventually be confronted with religion. Religion is not just a personal matter between a believer and his or her God, but regulations imposed on society with real and brutal punishments and repercussions for those deemed transgressors. The veil, for example, is far from a personal choice and a right. Socially speaking, on a mass scale, it is enforced through compulsory veiling, laws and acid attacks, imprisonment, fines, as well as pressures which look upon unveiled women as whores, immoral, and sources of fitna or chaos in society. Calling an improperly veiled woman in Britain, for example, hojabi, is part of that pressure. Under such circumstances, criticism of religion is key for the defense of rights and equality. It's also a critical necessity in order to dismantle and undermine the sacred and its political role. And it's not just about religion's role over there. Islamism is a vast network with global reach. The Islamic regime of Iran, for example, has sentenced artist Atena Farahdani to 12 years in prison for a cartoon and what it has called illegitimate sexual relations short of adultery merely because she shook the hands of her lawyer in a country where that is illegal because of gender apartheid rules. Now, here in Britain, it, similarly in a way, you've got Universities UK, which has endorsed gender segregation. Of course, that's now been withdrawn as a result of our protests. And you have a student organizer, for example, advising me not to shake hands with a man prior to a debate on Sharia law out of respect for some Islamist. Of course, I made it a point to shake his hands, as I have no respect for an idea that sees me as so haram that a man cannot shake my hands. Call me what you will. Islamism, is, as a political movement, is a global killing machine that affects people everywhere. Islamists will hack atheist bloggers to death in Bangladesh, whilst placing UK-based bloggers on death lists. And of course, lovely British jihadis like Mohammed Mwazi will kill for ISIS, whilst UK-based organizations like CAGE promotes defensive jihad. Limiting free expression to that which is acceptable for the Islamists, after all, it is those in power that determine the limits to expression, restricts the right to speak for those who need it most. It's telling people like myself, that we cannot oppose the theocracies we have fled from, or that people living under the boot of the religious right or faced with segregation and Sharia courts right here in Britain must not refuse and resist. It's our culture and religion after all. We have no choice but to submit. Ironically, the postmodernist leftists, and I put them in quotes because I'm very much on the left myself, pushing this line, have one set of progressive politics for themselves. They rightly want gay marriage, women's equality, the right to criticize and make fun of Jesus and archbishops and the Pope, as well as the Christian right, like Britain First and EDL. But they have another set of rules for us. We are merely allowed to make demands within the confines of Islam and identity politics, and only after taking note of the power imbalance. 
As an ex-Muslim migrant woman, I am supposedly a minority within a minority, but this power imbalance never seems to be part of any calculation. If we speak, we are labeled native informants by so-called progressives. And of course, the far right accuses us of practicing taqiyya if we oppose their scapegoating of Muslims and immigrants and their placing of collective blame on the other, exactly what the Islamists do as well. I have also been accused of practicing taqiyya by the likes of Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller. And that is whereby Muslims, because I'm actually an undercover Muslim as well, are allowed to lie to advance the cause of Islam, gaining the trust of all you naive non-believers in order to draw out your vulnerability and eventually defeat you. That is whereby, whereby we Muslims, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, what those conflating Islam, Islamism, and Muslims miss, both on the left as well as on the far right, is that many Muslims are also critics of Islamism and even Islam. In fact, Muslims, or those labeled as such, presumed as such, including people like myself, are often the first victims of Islamism and on the forefront of resistance. After all, not everyone in the Islamic world or Muslim community or those labeled Muslim students on campus are Muslims. And even if they are, religion is not necessarily the only characteristic that defines them. Moreover, the rise of Islamism has been met with a corresponding rise in the demand for atheism, secularism, and particularly women's liberation. Moreover, ordinary believers, ordinary Muslims, like any other believers, they pick and choose and mold their beliefs to make them compatible with contemporary life, which is why they often don't recognize their religion in the Islamists conflating criticism of Islam and Islamism with bigotry against Muslims sees dissent through the eyes of Islamists and not the many who refuse and resist. For those who have bought into this Islamist narrative, there are no social and political movements, class politics, dissenters, women's rights campaigners, socialists, just homogenized Muslims, and you should actually read Islamists when you say Muslims, who face intimidation and discrimination if an ex-Muslim woman speaks on a university campus. This is the problem with multiculturalism and identity politics. The homogenized group identity is the only one that seems to exist. The authentic Muslim is always reactionary fully veiled and better to throw in a burqa and niqab for good measure, pro-sharia courts, pro-gender segregation, pro-death penalty for apostates and gay people, anti-Semitic and of course always anti-free expression. As Algerian sociologist Mariam Helalukas says, what is most upsetting is the implication that oppressed people can only turn out as fascists, never revolutionaries. Is this really what the left in Europe now believes? Just to tell you, this is a movement in Iran for unveiling, even though it's a prosecutable offense there. And um, there's <coughs> thousands upon thousands of women who have taken pictures of themselves unveiled in Iran and posted it on My Stealthy Freedom's Facebook page. Mariam Helalukas adds, can the left really accept that citizens are assigned a minority identity, often against their will, just on the basis of their name or their geographical origin or that of their families? Can the left accept that this communal identity supersedes people's civil rights? This is what was done to the Jews under Nazism. Will the left accept that it be done to Muslims or those presumed to be Muslims, regardless of their personal beliefs? If the left is serious about supporting oppressed minorities, it should realize that those who speak in the name of the community do not necessarily have the legitimacy to do so. By supporting fundamentalists, they simply choose one camp in a political struggle without acknowledging it. The result of all this, says Keenan Malek, is that solidarity has become increasingly defined not in political terms, 
as collective action in pursuit of certain ideals, but in terms of ethnicity and culture. And since those in power determine culture, or the dominant culture, many student unions, those on the left, feminists, side with the Islamists at our expense. They don't see that at its core, this is a fight between theocrats and the religious right on the one hand, and secularists, including many Muslims, and those fighting for social justice on the other. It's a fight taking place within and across communities and borders, including and especially amongst those within what is labeled the Muslim community or world. Take the example of 27-year-old Farhonde, accused by a mullah in Afghanistan of being an infidel who burnt verses of the Quran. She was attacked by a mob in Kabul, lynched, stoned, run over, burnt, her body thrown in the river while onlookers and police stood by. What can she expect when she goes against Muslim sensibilities, tweeted one of these absurd liberal left do-gooders who only seem to do good for religion and the religious right wing, but never for women. But wasn't Farhonde Muslim too? Actually, she was very devout and had gone to the local mullah who accused her to tell him to stop selling amulets to women. What became very obvious after her murder was that not all Afghans and not all Muslims or Muslim men have the same sensibilities. Women carried her coffin going against Islamic customs with the permission of her family to the gravesite and they were encircled by men there to protect them. They surrounded her coffin right to the end, gave her the respect that she deserves and chanted, we are all Farhonde. And when a mullah, who had originally justified her murder, tried to join them, they refused. They encircled her coffin and they forced him to leave. Az Arjun, a youth activist, said, this is what Farhonde teaches me. Together we can change the narrative that others write about women. We stood up against the most respected mullah we carried her coffin and we buried her. Niayesh, a medical student, said, it's the first time I realized my real power and told myself that I am breaking the boundaries of tradition. So the people of Afghanistan do not all agree. Muslims are not all the same. And I place Muslims in quotes, since not everyone living in Afghanistan or Iran are Muslims or Islamists, just like not everyone in Britain is Christian or EDL or Britain first. Everywhere, from Iran to Afghanistan to Algeria, there are women and men who break taboos and change narratives and stand against religion's encroachment on people's lives and against Islamism. Charlie Hebdo is another good example. 145 writers disgracefully opposed Penn's award to Charlie because they said it was valorizing selectively offensive material, material that intensified the anti-Islamic, anti-Maghreb, anti-Arab sentiments already prevalent in the Western world. But as Salman Rushdie said, the Charlie Hebdo artists were executed in cold blood for drawing satirical cartoons, which is an entirely legitimate activity. It is quite right that Penn should honor their sacrifice and condemn their murder. This issue has nothing to do with an oppressed or disadvantaged minority. It has everything to do with the battle against fanatical Islam, which is highly organized, well-funded, and which seeks to terrify us all, Muslims as well as non-Muslims, into a cowed silence. And a lot of people, including Muslims, agree. Mustafa Orad, he's a native Algerian and a copy editor for Charlie Hebdo, who was killed in the attack. You have a French Muslim cafe owner from East London who was threatened for putting up Asia Sweet Charlie sign outside his cafe. In Turkey, you've got two columnists from a daily who are facing an investigation for religious defamation after featuring the Charlie cover. And from Egypt to Lebanon to Qatar and Jordan, 
cartoonists took a stand with Charlie and against the Islamists. Even in Iran, which is a theocracy, I want to remind you, where 130 offenses are punishable by death, including apostasy, blasphemy, heresy, enmity against God, corruption on earth, and what have you. Nasrin Sutadeh, who's a human rights lawyer, she showed her solidarity with Charlie. Whilst journalists trying to join a rally in support of the Charlie cartoonists were attacked and prevented from protesting by security agents wielding clubs and chains. An Iranian newspaper was shut down for publishing a photo in solidarity with Charlie. So clearly, not all Muslims were offended, and even those who were did not go on to kill for it. In Bangladesh, too, you've got Islamists killing and threatening beloved atheist bloggers like Avijit Roy, but there is also a deeply secular movement against them, including 24 villages that have become known as Jamaat Free Villages. Jamaat Islami is the main Islamist organization there, or Islamist Free Villages. Religion is not the only marker for our societies and communities, nor is it the most important. I, for example, only read the Quran after I became an ex-Muslim and atheist. I was born into it, just like nearly everyone is, depending on where you are born. It's geography and your parents' religion that mostly determine yours. In Iran, I didn't have to wear the veil. I went to a mixed school. I wasn't treated differently because I was a girl. I hadn't heard the terms taqiyya or jihad. Religion only became relevant in my life when it came to power in Iran. Then the veil became an issue. That's my picture of me veiled. I went to a mixed school. I wasn't treated differently. Uh, uh, sorry, the, then the veil became an issue. The Hezbollah types then were sent to our school to separate the boys from the girls, though of course we ran circles around them. And then my school and others were shut down in order to Islamicize them. And then of course came the executions and the slaughter of an entire generation by what became known in many places such as Algeria by the green fascists. What is often forgotten is that most people are born into their religion out of no choice of their own, and that lack of choice and labeling follows them even into adulthood until the day they die, unless they make what is very, a very difficult and painful decision to leave. And even when people remain religious, their religion is not necessarily, and more likely than not, the religion of the Islamists. If it were, the Islamists would not need to kill so many people. Islamism's culture is not the culture of many who refuse and resist or who just want to live 21st century lives. It's not ours. Nonetheless, this conflation of Islam, Islamism, and Muslims has been the position of successive British governments, whereby multiculturalism and multi-faithism have been promoted as social policies to defend religion's role in the public space impose religious identity as the only marker to define citizens and hand large sections of citizens to be managed and controlled by regressive Islamist organizations and parasitical imams. This has been part of the neoconservative project for the extreme right-wing restructuring of societies. There are no more citizens, but segregated communities with their own faith schools their own faith-based services, and of course their own faith-based courts, from Sharia courts to the Beth Din, separate and unequal. The far right too, which claims to despise multiculturalism, benefits from the idea of difference, to scapegoat the other, and to promote its own form of vile white identity politics. <coughs> Ironically, left groups, which are traditionally seen to be anti-state, reiterate the government's multiculturalism, multi-faithism, and identity politics, as well as the far-right narrative, and side with our oppressors by placing individuals into homogenized, restrictive boxes, denying diversity and dissent, and equating Muslims with Islamists, albeit in different ways. 
rather than siding with the vast secular and progressive forces in the so-called Muslim communities or the so-called Islamic world. This section of the left, which Dawkins refers to as the regressive left, sides with and pushes the Islamist narrative that denies universalism, sees rights, equality, and secularism as Western, justifies the suppression of women, apostates, and blasphemers under the guise of respect for other cultures, imputing on innumerable people the most reactionary elements of culture and religion, which is that of the religious right. In the world of these apologists, the oppressor is victim, the oppressed incite hatred, and any criticism is bigotry. Of course, where Islamists are in power, there are no such niceties about concern for minorities and safe spaces. Dissenters are prosecuted for blasphemy, apostasy, enmity against God, full stop. People like Raif Badawi, sentenced to 10 years in prison, and a thousand lashes in Saudi Arabia for raising the question of religion and politics. Shahrukh Zamani, found dead in prison recently after being sentenced to 11 years in Iran for labor organizing activities where the strike is deemed haram or religiously pro pro uh, prohibited. Women's rights campaigner Saad al-Shamari, who's imprisoned on ac accusations of insulting Islam and the Prophet in Saudi Arabia for demanding an end to male guardianship rules for women, which is basically that women can't go anywhere without the permission of a male guardian. Poet Fatima Naoud, who's on trial for insulting Islam in Egypt because she criticized Islamic animal slaughter. And Roya Nobacht, who's a 47-year-old British-Iranian woman, who has initially been sentenced to 20 years in prison merely for saying on Facebook that the Iranian regime is a little too Islamic. Saying Charlie Hebdo cartoonist had it coming is like saying Shahrukh Zamani deserved to die in prison and that Raif deserves his lashes for being inflammatory and offending <coughs> Islam and the Islamists in power. Here, of course, rather than accusations of blasphemy and apostasy, critics face charges of Islamophobia and offense. What's packaged as the culture of offense is really Islamism's imposition of blasphemy laws under the pretext of respect for Muslim sensibilities. As I've said before, this is very much the government and the political establishment's line too. In September, police removed artwork by Mimsy from London Mall galleries, which showed mysis lurking in the background, featuring children's toys, Sylvanian families, after the police raised serious concerns on the potentially <coughs> inflammatory content. So I'd like you to avert your eyes now if you, if you can't manage to look at these pieces of art. The culture of offense absurdly implies that civility and manners are all that's needed to stop abductions and the slaughter of generations from Nigeria, Iran to Algeria. But the culture of offense is a smokescreen. It serves to legitimize Islamist violence and terror and blame the victims. It misses the point. Being a woman, being a free thinker, being gay, being unveiled, being improperly veiled, being an atheist, going to school, driving a car, having sex, <coughs> falling in love, laughing a little too loud, dancing, all of this offends them. Calling for civility, censorship, silence, or respect for the offended is merely heeding the Islamist demand for submission at the expense of dissenters. But as Rosa Luxemburg has said, freedom is always the freedom of dissenters. Charges of offense and Islamophobia aim not, in my opinion, to prevent bigotry. You can't stop bigotry with censorship, but to stop criticism and deflect legitimate outrage against Islamism. It really aims to prevent blasphemy. This is a perfect example of a Jesus and Mo cartoon. Jesus says, if we want to live together peacefully in a multicultural society, we have to ensure that everyone's fundamental beliefs are protected from attack and ridicule. And the barmaid says, I don't want my fundamental beliefs to be protected. Thanks. Please feel free to attack or ridicule them 
anytime you wish. And of course, Muhammad says racist. <laughs> Calling it racism fails to understand that the other also has it, its dissenters who want to live free from religion's stranglehold. Plus, isn't it racist to imply that all Muslims cannot tolerate criticism and free thought other than via violence, and that Muslims are one and the same as Islamists? Seriously, every time I hear this, I feel offended on behalf of my parents and my family and loads of my friends, you know, to see that this equation takes place when it's so untrue. Islamophobia is a political term coined by Islamists and their apologists to scaremonger people into silence and censor dissent. And I want to give you one example of this. This is on Facebook. Um, someone who's with MEND, it's, it's an um, Islamist organization. And he, he's one of the staff there. And he says, Allah Akbar, after years of groundwork, we have just heard that the government will make it a legal requirement for all police forces in the UK to record Islamophobic attacks as a separate hate crime like anti-Semitism. Up until now, police forces were not required to record anti-Muslim hate crimes. It's very good that they're recording anti-Muslim hate crimes. But I just want to show you how there's, you know, the, the words are sort of just, different words are used intermittently from Islamophobic to then Muslims. Therefore, in the past, if a Muslim was attacked, the police would record it as a race hate crime. And as a result, we were unable to study the real prevalence of anti-Muslim hate crime in the UK. But all that is now going to change, alhamdulillah. For anyone doubting how important this is, you just need to spend five minutes at men to see how the challenges that we have had to overcome to get to this change, uh, stage, alhamdulillah, again. This is the first major step, now this is what I want you to pay attention to, in completely outlawing Islamophobia in the UK. Make dua that just like anti-Semitism, anyone who writes or says anything malicious against Islam will be prosecuted in the future, inshallah. This conflation between Muslims, Islamists, and Islam, something that the Islamists have made into an art form. The solution, in my opinion, lies in returning to basics, citizenship rights, equality of people, irrespective of beliefs, respect for people, not for religions, and certainly not for the religious right wing, an end to faith-based initiatives that divide and segregate universal rights, one law for all, with equal access to justice, an uncompromising defense of secularism and the separation of religion from the state, and of course, unconditional free expression. As philosopher Roger Scruton said earlier this week, if you invoke the law at all, it should be to protect the one who gives the offense and not the one who takes it. But of course, now it's the other way around. To combat the normalization and legitimization of censorship, free thinkers must celebrate blasphemy, as Ina Shevchenko's Femin says. A feminine says, as must we celebrate apostasy. We are not allowed to leave Islam. We can be executed for leaving Islam. Then it becomes all the more urgent for us to renounce Islam publicly via groups like the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. When it is possible to shout our apostasy from every rooftop, then the very need to do so will no longer have an urgency. Blasphemy and apostasy are not the denial of religious freedom. There is no freedom of religion without freedom from religion. And I truly believe that criticism of religion is an essential aspect of being fully human in the age of ISIS. Freedom to express liberation from religion is also very much relevant with regards to nude protest. The idealized woman in Islam is obedient, properly veiled, submissive, and accepting of her assigned place in society. The rest of us are whores, often compared to unwrapped sweets. This is a billboard in Iran, which shows that the hijab is security. If you're not veiled, you're like unwrapped sweets, covered in flies and free for the taking. Women are considered the source of fitna in society, and blamed for every calamity and natural disaster, as well as, of course, the disintegration of the family and society 
and deserving of punishment in order to maintain national and Islamic values, pride and honor. Islamism's obsession with women's bodies and its insistence that women be veiled and hidden from view means that nudity becomes an important form of public resistance. The Islamists want us bound in body bags, not seen and not heard. We refuse to comply, just as we refuse to stop blaspheming and apostatizing or demanding secularism and free expression. Uh, this is a protest in Paris where I cut the Allah out of the Iranian regime's flag and put something more worthy in its place. <laughs> Those who consider apostasy or blasphemy as culturally insensitive or inappropriate or Western or colonialist are only considering Islamism sensibilities and the values of the many who resist, not the values of the many who resist. Only when we begin to see that dissent acknowledge that it is intrinsically linked to our own and defend universal values, secularism, free expression, and a re renewed enlightenment against what I call the Islamic Inquisition, we, will we be able to truly honor our dissenters, stand with them, and push back the religious right wing. Clearly, in all of this, free expression is key. It's not a luxury, it's not a privilege, it's a right, and it's not up for sale. For many of us, it is the only way we can fight to breathe, to challenge those in power who stifle us, and to demand change. Limiting free expression is not just censorship, as Salman Rushdie says, but an assault on human nature. Human beings, he says, shape their futures by arguing and challenging and saying the unsayable, not by bowing their knees, whether to gods or to men. In the age of ISIS, this is truly a historic task and necessity. Thank you. I, I do want to just end by making a plea on behalf of migrants everywhere. If you oppose US-led militarism and imperialism, if you oppose ISIS and theocracies and Islamic states, then you have a moral responsibility to stand with the victims and survivors of these wars and inhumanities and brutalities. The world has built a fortress against migrants trying to escape situations that are clearly so unbearable and inhuman. And freedom of movement has to, we have to reiterate that freedom of movement is a fundamental right, as is the right to live free in peace and free from fear and war. I think that we should be calling for open borders. The masses who are fleeing are voting with their very feet against inhumanity and injustice. They are the best of all of our societies, and we must stand with them, especially today when we see so much desperation on, uh, around us. Thank you. Yes. How uh, this is a problem for the majority of Muslims do not have, have the same idea of Islam. But I didn't hear as much as, like, since obviously, since we're here talking about it, it seems like it's obvious that they have been successful in kind of portraying that most Muslims are, in fact, in line with their thinking. And uh, my question is, how would you go around, you know, combating this? How would you go around actually, you know, raising more the minority voices who are actually against this? kind of help people recognize, okay, you're not talking about Islam, you're talking about Islam, isn't it? Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Um, I was just wondering what you would say to those women who wear the veil or the judge and say it's a personal choice and it actually is a kind of representative of their personal freedom. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll start with the, uh, your um, question. I mean, I, I think, uh, again, one of the main uh, nude activist is Alia Magda El Mahdi, who is an Egyptian herself. And she took her nude photo while she was living in Egypt. 
she was uh, kidnapped by Islamists, threatened, and now she's had to flee, and she has uh, been granted asylum in Sweden. So what, what I want to say is that it's, it's not just, you know, nude protest is not just something that is um, people who have been raised in, let's say, societies in the Middle East are opposed to unequivocally, and people support it in the West. We know in the West there are many, many feminists who are opposed to nude protest. Uh, there are many people who don't agree with it. On the other hand, you have many people in the Middle East and North Africa who are supportive of it. So what I want to say is that I, I think the whole basis of my talk was that you cannot determine how people will feel about something just because their name is a Muslim name like mine. Mine is Namazi, which means prayer. Just because I come from a Muslim family, my, my grandfather was an Islamic scholar. You, ca you can't make those assumptions based on identity, based on uh, where someone was born, based on many things, you know. I believe there is a tsunami of atheism, for example, in the Middle East and North Africa. In, I think in Iran there is a huge anti-Islamic backlash, and particularly in societies where a majority are young, like in Iran where 70% of the population are young. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's a, a reality. So what I want to say is that when I did this action, there was a huge explosion in Iran with many people who were supportive, you know, and many people who were against. So it's not automatic. The other thing for me is I think that, you know, um, we have a risk, you know, when the space is so tight where you can't breathe anymore, seriously, that's what Islamists have done in Egypt, in Iran, in many places, you can't breathe anymore. The only way to breathe is to push open spaces so that more people can breathe, more people can descend. They may not agree with the way I descend, but my descent opens the way for others to, to speak, including Muslims who might be veiled, who might oppose uh, my method or Alia Magda El Mahdi's me methods. Uh, you know, like the suffragists, everybody hated them. They were considered terrorists or whatever, but they do open a space. Uh, and I think we have to acknowledge that sometimes uh, these sort of movements that are seen to be too radical eventually help to open enough space so that people can uh, be able to breathe and live uh, lives that they choose, which is not possible now in, in many places across the world and also in many places in Europe itself. Um, on the issue of um, how to convince people um, <coughs> that Muslims are not Islamists, I mean, I, I think that's one of the things I try to do in my talks, for example. <clears throat> yeah. It's more like how would you recognize, okay, someone is in fact talking to you, is it is it, is it, is it is not actually someone who's talking to you. I see. How to recognize. Uh, how do you recognize someone who is a member of the English Defense League and British First versus anybody sitting in this room? Yeah, I, I think it's quite simple actually. You know, uh, y y there are people who belong to a, an organized political movement that is fascist. And the, the problem is, because of this conflation, people seem to find it very confusing, but I don't see why it needs to be. You know, the Islamists are our fascists. So they're very different. The Christian right is your fascists, or our fascists, all of us living here. The EDL, Britain first, they are disgusting, they're vile. How can I tell the EDL from any of you? I think it's quite simple. You, you need to hear what people have to say. You need to know where they stand on various issues. Uh, and I think that's how we can distinguish um, uh, between Muslims and Islamists. And also, I think, you know, one of the problems is that because for so long Muslims have been seen to be the same as Islamists, nothing else is ever shown or highlighted. You know, you, you don't see the huge protests that are taking place, the huge movements that are taking place in the Middle East, in North Africa, for secularism, for equality, and so on and so forth. Just to give you an example, last month, there were mass demonstrations in Iraq for secularism. Did you hear about them? In Baghdad, half a million people came out with banners saying neither Sunni nor Shia, but secularism. How many of you heard about those protests? But an Islamist bombs somewhere and we hear about it. And then we're not supposed to criticize because it will so supposedly offend Muslims. Though that Islamist bomb killed more Muslims than anybody else. You know, so what I want to say is that Part of it is to recognize Islamism as a political movement. Part of it is to see, open your eyes and see the dissent. It exists everywhere, but are you willing to see it? And I think once you're willing to see it, 
you will be surprised at where, you know, that it, it comes up in, in the most unexpected places. And finally, on the issue of the veil, I mean, I think there's no right or wrong answer about the veil. Personally, for me, I think the veil is a tool for repression. I, to me, it's like the chastity belt or, you know, foot binding, uh, where women's feet were bound so that they couldn't move too far away from their male guardian. I think fundamentally, veiling is the same concept. It's it's to, it's a form of control of women. It's it's, you know. Only the man who owns the woman is allowed to see her unveiled. Um, and if she isn't veiled, or if she, she isn't properly veiled, because in Iran, for example, veiling is compulsory. You, you're the source of fitna and chaos in society. You know, you've got to cover her up completely so that we can have society. And you know, women are blamed for earthquakes and so on and so forth every day. You know, but I think it's a very different thing then to blaming women who are veiled. It, you know, the example I always give is I'm opposed to FGM, but for goodness sakes, I do it because I want to defend women's rights, not because I want to attack every girl who's been mutilated. And it's the same with the veil. You know, I see it as a symbol that doesn't mean that people don't necessarily have a right to wear the veil. But what I say is that this right is qualified because until the day that I'm not called a whore for not wearing a veil, that veil, the woman who is wearing a veil is not really choosing it because there is no real choice given the pressures and the intimidations that are involved. So for me, uh, I think it's, it's a much more complex issue, but I will say this, I am wholeheartedly against child veiling. I think it's a form of abuse because it, it symbolizes gender segregation. The girl who is veiled in her class cannot go to music lessons, cannot play with boys anymore, cannot do sports, cannot swim, cannot feel the wind in her hair. It is not fair for a child only because her parents are Muslims. It's not fair. You've heard this argument many times before, if, if because I'm a communist, no one tells my child he's a communist child. But if I'm a Muslim, my child is automatically Muslim and must be veiled and eat halal food and everything that goes with it. That's not fair. And I think we have to say that children have more rights than, um, you know, they, they don't, they are not properties of their parents. They are individuals and human beings in their own right, and their rights need to be respected. In fact, they need to be protected even more because they're so vulnerable. Um, and, and also, I am completely against the burqa. I think it is a body bag. It is a mobile prison. It is just, you know, outrageous that women should be compelled to, even if it's their choice, should be compelled to wear, uh, wear, wear that contraption and walk in the street. Try wearing that and walking in the street. And, and the, the restrictions that it gives you and the feeling that it gives you is just, you know, I think that's something that should be banned. It should have been banned in Afghanistan the minute the Taliban were kicked out in order to free women. And we have to look at this as well. You know, the French laws um, where they banned conspicuous religious symbols in schools, um, you know, the studies have shown that it's a fa there are very, very few girls who wanted to continue to wear the hijab. Most felt freed that they were able to then do what they wanted by saying this is the law. And also, it reduces pressure on the girls who don't want to be veiled. Because when there is girls who are veiled in the school, and the expectation that a good Muslim girl has to be veiled, it means you all have to, whether you want to or not. So. Um, do you think that Islamism is a form of fundamentalism or a form of extremism? Mm -hmm. I'll wait for a few. Sure. Um, I'm an Iranian, and I know a lot of um, women in Iran, especially at the moment, do oppose Islamism. But I was wondering how you would suggest that these women that are living under this oppression should start moving against it and fight for equality. Yeah. Hi, this is just more of a comment. I think you've got a lot of support from Muslims, especially ones in Britain like myself, who are absolutely disgusted that you're born and are really glad that you're here today. Mm -hmm. I think there's an issue of them trying to speak out and being classified about being scared of being portrayed as not really a Muslim mm -hmm. because they're standing up from what we perceive as actually um, an Islamic viewpoint which says whether you are my brother in faith or brother in humanity, you are always my brother. Mm -hmm. And I think they're trying to go against years and years 
of culture from their parents that don't promote free thinking. Um, and that is not the Islamic point, that is the culture, and they're trying to fight against that. So it's not so much that people don't agree with you, it's that they're afraid to come out and say it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I personally believe that the reason why there's so much common ground between Muslims and Islamists is for the pure fact of Amr of Amr of Munkar, which I don't know how to explain in English. But um, I feel like that's the reason why you can't say this person is Muslim and this person is Islamist. Mm -hmm. Because my aunt, you know, she's very religious. She's not She's not going to go out there and kill anyone. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, every time sometimes something goes wrong, she tells me of so much, so much. And I feel like that kind of becomes that kind of fundamentalism mm -hmm. that I find very, very common in extreme Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see what you think about okay. that. Okay, thank you. Um, on, on the question of, uh, sorry, where was that? Islam <coughs> and fundamentalism. Sorry, I, gosh, you see, I, I'm going to need my glasses. Um, Islam, Islamism, I think Islamism is a far right uh, fascist movement. Uh, and I see it as a very similar. Fundamentally, though, don't, you know, don't all go crazy on me because the minute I say this, everybody goes crazy on me. But it's sort. It's the same as the Christian right. It's the same as the Hindu right. Um, which, for example, in Hindu right, there are programs against Muslims there, and there's like Muslims were massacred in Gujarat in 2002 by the Hindu right, the RSS, and Modi, who's prime minister now, uh, is very much part of that movement. Uh, or you've got the um, Jewish right, for example, and the settlers in in, in the Palestinian territories. So I, I know the next thing people will say, but you know, the EDL isn't beheading anybody. Uh, okay, I, I understand that, but what I'm saying is that fundamentally, these movements are similar. The extent to which they kill and cause destruction and terrorize people depends on the amount of power that they have. I don't like the term fundamentalist only because it's often used as a way of saying what the good Islamists versus the bad Islamists, you know, so the fundamentalists are the ones who don't agree with Western government policy. The good ones are then not called fundamentalists, they're called moderate Muslims or something. And for me, uh, there is no moderate fascist, you know, it's a fascist movement, there's no moderation. That's why I, I use, I prefer to use the term religious right wing. Um, and because it also shows it's linked with other religious right-wing movements, like the Buddhist right, by the way, in Myanmar and um, um, Sri Lanka, that is uh, attacking Muslims as well. So um, it, it shows that they're linked and also that um, where they stand politically, uh, and that it's more about politics than it is about religion, though religion, of course, is a huge part of it. Yeah? Does that help? You look so like I did not explain anything that you asked me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, do you think that it's comes from like a literal interpretation of the text? Uh, so it's a problem with the text, or because it's a yeah, I I don't think it comes from a literal interpretation of the text in many places because I think Islamists are political beasts, and they use whatever they can, wherever they can, in order to justify what they're doing. So if it's not in the Quran, they'll find it in the Hadith. If it's not in the Hadith, they'll say, I don't know who did it, where. Or if it's not in the Quran and Hadith and who did it, where, they'll suddenly find some crazy mullah to give a fatwa, insane fatwa of the day, you know. So um, I, I, it's the same way when George Bush attacks somewhere or Tony Blair attack somewhere, they'll suddenly invoke women's rights and Western British values and so on and so forth, but they're just making excuses for, for what they do. And I think in the same way, uh, I, and that's why I think it's important to look at it as a political movement. You have the far right saying, we've got to ban the Quran and then we'll get rid of Islamists. No, you won't. You didn't get rid of the Spanish Inquisition by banning the Bible, did you now? No. You did it by pushing back the Christian right at the time. Um, on women in Iran, what can they do? I mean, I think they're doing it. I, I think that the women's uh, rights movement in Iran is the most wonderful thing to see and to be a part of, really. I mean, in a sense, what we do, a lot of us do um, here in exile, is a continuation of what is being done in Iran at much greater risk and with much greater bravery. Um, and I think the women's uh, liberation movement in Iran uh, will one day uh, 
represent, be, be something to be gawked at, you know, looked at and described. You know how they always tell us, oh, these are Western values? Well, one day you're going to say these are Eastern values. And, you know, and I, I think the, the explosion for women's liberation, for secularism, for atheism, it is in the Middle East. Um, and I think Iran is one of the main areas of that uh, explosion. And part of it has to do with the fact that we had a revolution in Iran, which was a left-leaning revolution. Of course, today it's called an Islamic revolution because victors always write history and they decide how it is described. Um, but it was a left-leaning revolution that was suppressed by the Islamic movement. It was expropriated by the Islamic movement. And we lost an entire generation uh, via this suppression and expropriation. And so that revolution is still alive, you know, in the same way as we still feel the effects of the Bolshevik Revolution, the French Revolution. The, the Iranian Revolution is very much alive, and we see that all the time, even though it's constantly suppressed, it's constantly pushed back, but there is constant <clears throat> fight back. Um, so I think, you know, it's not what they should do, it's what we should do to learn from them and show solidarity with them. And I think one of the problems is uh, that I mentioned earlier in the quote of Kinan Malik where he said that identity politics means that we no longer show solidarity with ideals and only with ethnicities and uh, you know the sort of communities that are homogenized. That's why we're not seeing the real sort of solidarity that's needed with women and people in Iran and elsewhere from Egypt to Algeria and elsewhere who are fighting Islamists um, with every, everything that, that they have. Um, thank you very much for saying that. I mean, I think fear is a huge, um, huge uh, part of it. And I think the more of us that speak out, the less people will feel afraid. And the more we will begin to see results, um, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I think the work we've done in, in the Council of Ex-Muslims, for example, yes, we've been called provocative and inflammatory, uh, but I, I think it has opened a space even for many Muslims to be able to speak today. And if you look at this, the, the climate today, it's very different from one ten years ago. And I think it is thanks to the work of groups like ours, not only us, but thanks to the group of works, work like ours. And I think the more of us speak out, the more we will be able to push back the Islamists, but also defend um, defend uh, minorities amongst us. I mean, one of the things Keenan Malik says, as you can tell, I'm in love with him now. I, I, I know his words not by heart. It's pretty scary. Uh, so one of the things he says is, when you're demanding unconditional free expression, you also have a moral obligation to stand up to bigotry, xenophobia, and so on and so forth. And, and that is the moral obligation that lies on all of us. On you're not being able to tell Muslims from Islamists, I, I mean, I, I don't agree. And I'll tell you why. Because I think that uh, you're never going to find people who are wonderfully progressive. You know, there's all people, we all have our prejudices, you know. And uh, so you'll find, you know, um, people who are opposed to the Islamists in Iran, for example, our parents who are, you know, everything is the fault of the Jews. You know how they, that, gosh, it's like, no, no, it's not, actually. You know, everything is the fault of the Jews. Or, you know, things that they might say about gay people, things they might say about uh, women. Uh, and, but that's not just our communities. It's not just Iranians or Muslims. You see that among the British. Honestly, criticize someone who's defending UKIP, and it doesn't take two minutes before they tell me I have to get on a boat and go back home. You know, we're never considered citizens, we're never considered to have the right to speak. We only have a right to speak if we agree with them. If we don't agree with them, we should get on a boat and go back home. So what I want to say is that the fact that people are, have prejudices is very different from saying that they are fascists. And that is a distinction we have to recognize. Otherwise, uh, you know, that it's like saying everyone who's English is part of the Britain first, it's not the case. There are lots of people who are coming out in defense of refugee rights, in defense of uh, equality against, you know, the, against University UK and their endorsement of gender segregation, for example. Lots of people came out against it. So again, the idea that not everybody thinks the same who are Muslim, also not everybody thinks the same who are English or Christian and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah.
Um, here in the West, many people have made the claim that the Islamic State, Al Qaeda, Al Shabaab, etc., have nothing to do with Islam or even Islamism. I think uh, many Hassan made that point. He claims that even the most literal interpretation of Al Quran could not possibly lead to the emergence of these groups. Uh, to what extent do you agree with this? And do you think that this, these are manifestations of Islamism? Mm -hmm. Any questions? In the back. Uh, my, my question kind of ties into that. Um, you've been quite keen on separating the concept of Islamism and those who follow Islamic religion and are Muslim. So why, when in your talk you're referring to Islamic State and ISIS, do you not refer to it as what's, what's quite commonly used to term as the sort of so-called Islamic State? Why do you refer to it as Islamic State as a thing that does that cause? Okay. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Thank you. Um, yes. Um, I'm one from an organization called Student Rights, and we do a lot of work on extremism on campus. Um, as you discovered that there's an increase in sort of culture of suppressing criticism of religion on campus. Meanwhile, um, extremist uh, religious speakers who promote anti-Semitism and homophobia often go unchallenged. I was just wondering um, how you think we can go about changing this. How to so we can go and change this sort okay. of culture as a religion. <coughs> My mind is getting a bit, let me write down my point before I forget it. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Uh, now, what does it have to do with Islam? Where are you? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, first of all, you mentioned Mehdi Hassan. Now, Mehdi Hassan has called us atheists, animals, and so on and so forth. Have you heard that? So he's, oh, yeah. he, he's not one to talk about um, these sort of distinctions. But anyway, I mean, I think it would be untrue to say that Islamism has nothing to do with Islam. Obviously it does. It's their banner. They are using verses of the Quran, the Hadith, and so on and so forth. And the point I was trying to make is that, yes, Islam is the banner, but if we look at Islamism first and foremost as a political movement, then we can see that they'll use it where it, it helps them and they'll, won't, they'll ignore it where it doesn't. So just to give you an example, that there was a long period of time when the Iranian regime wanted to increase the population because they were just killing everybody, weren't they? And also they had children and people going on mines to, in the Iran-Iraq war that was so disastrous for eight years. So they wanted to increase the population. So they found something somewhere in the Quran or Hadith, which said that everyone has to have a million babies. And now they don't want to have any more children because the children that have been born under this regime are their greatest enemies, so they want to uh, promote birth control. So now they found something else in the Quran or Hadith or somewhere that proves their point. So what I want to say is that, yes, it does have something to do with it, but that's not the whole story. And I think what, where it's is mistaken is when the far right blames it only on Islam. Because they love religion and political power, they just want their beloved Christianity to be in power. Uh, you know, and doing as it will, rather than having this foreign religion interfere you know, with things. So um, that would be my answer, that yes, it has something to do with it. No, it's not everything. Is, you, know, you yourself, for example, mentioned that your Islam is very different from the Islam of the Islamism, Islamists. I agree, in the sense that people interpret religion in the way that they want. You know, no Christian today, uh, for example, in Britain, will refer to the Bible and where it promotes stoning. Uh, do you know what I mean? Because it, it's con they're they're now um, they're not referring to the Bible when they say they're Christians. They're uh, picking and choosing and taking bits that they like, Jesus is love, love is God, whatever, the bits that they like, forgetting the Old Testament and all the things that they don't want to remember. And, and most people haven't even read the Bible, to be honest. Just like I hadn't read the Quran, you're just born into it. This is who you are, there's your label on your forehead, now be gone, you know. Um, and so in that sense, you know, people don't see their religion in the religion of the Islamists. But for me, I, I hate religion, and again, you can hate an idea, right? It's not bigotry. Uh, and I've said this many times, I think religion is like um, cigarettes, it should come with a health <coughs> warning, you know, it kills. Uh, that it's, um, you know, Marx called it the opium of the masses, I think they should call it the genocidaire of the masses. But, but that's a different point. So for me, I think Islam in and of itself is 
uh, misogynist, it's homophobic, just like I think all religions are, because it was written for another time and period. You know, and, uh, but again, that's not the same as saying that all people who are religious are misogynist and homophobic. No, that's not the case. In fact, there are many um, believers who are uh, pro-women's rights, who are pro-secularism, who are pro-gay rights, pro-abortion rights, you name it. Yeah, we, we, we know of them, and we see that. Um, so that's why, coming to the question of the person who said, why don't I call it so-called Islamic State? Yes. Because for me, I think that is Islam. Yeah, and I make a distinction again between Islam, Islamism, and Muslims. And for me, uh, I, I know a lot of people I work with, because I work with many people who are Muslims, uh, who don't like uh, me even to use the term Sharia. So I've started saying Sharia. Okay, I'll do that, because we need to work together to get rid of this movement. But for me, I'm sorry, this is what it is. Sharia is based on the Quran, it's based on the Hadith, it's based on Islamic jurisprudence. All the four schools, um, Sunni, Shias, they all say it. Yeah. What, what is the punishment for apostasy? What's the punishment for stoning? What's the punishment for blasphemy? And on and on and on. So um, for me, I don't think it's a so-called Islamic state. I think the Islamic regime of Iran is an Islamic state. But again, with all the conditions and explanations I gave before. Okay, on the extremists in campus. I mean, I personally <coughs> believe that we should allow anyone to speak who is in, even inciting hatred. Because again, that's not very clear, is it? I mean, I think Islamists are inciting hatred against Jews, against ex-Muslims, against Muslims that don't agree, against women, against animals, against children, against everyone. Uh, if you go to a church and listen to a sermon, half the time I feel offended and I feel like they're inciting hatred against me as an atheist. I'm just giving an example. If, if you're going to stop inciting against hatred, you're going to have to shut down all the churches and mosques and, and temples and what have you and ban all the holy books because I think there's so much hatred in all of those. But we can't do that, can we? And also, what one person feels is inciting to hatred, another may not feel it. Well, okay, I'm offended, but I can manage, thank you. You know, you can say what you want, I'll say what I want. I think we should actually let Holocaust deniers, fascists, Islamists, and people like myself speak on a university campus in the public arena. And that is where uh, the battle is, is meant to be fought. Bad, if an idea is bad, let it be uh, challenged with better ideas. Uh, you know, so I, of course, if if the speakers are inciting violence, that's a very different issue. Um, but I, I think I agree with Gita Sakyal, who's the head of uh, Center for Secular Space. Um, she was sus fired from Amnesty International because many years ago she criticized their relationship with cage prisoners, and of course, all of that came out more recently, and she's been vindicated. But she was saying, well, let the fascists speak. Where are the students? The students should be chasing the fascists out rather than the government coming and giving more, you know, more forms of control on freedom of expression, which is exactly what we don't need. We need to be able to talk. That's the only thing we have to challenge the powers that be from the government to the Islamists to the fascists. Can I add to the point? Yes. Um, in light of this, the fracas concerning your initial buying, um, I received a few emails um, pertaining to few of the guest speakers from last year here at work and many of the four or five different um, emails regarding four or five different speakers um, primarily um, the emails were from Jewish students and complaining that um, showing correspondence between them and work at SU and they were trying to um, censor um, certain Holocaust deniers coming in um, and providing me a whole host of evidence to back up the claim and work as you demonstrating that point said, you know, we are bastions of free speech expression here on the university. It's something that we at work is integral to who we are here at work. Except? Except. <laughs> but I, I do want to say this too. I think the minute we accept censorship, we uh, we show that we're afraid to to actually challenge and address the the issues that are being raised, and we we shouldn't be afraid. <laughs> We should, there is no need to be afraid, and I think, uh, you know, if uh, someone denies the Holocaust, well, 
for goodness sakes, let them. That's so, so, so absurd. All you need to do is bring facts and, um, and challenge uh, that and do some nude protest as well, just to make them go crazy. <laughs> it's almost like having a variety of narratives and through a political ideology, the narrative has been constricted, constricted, yeah. constricted, constricted, constricted. And we as sectorists have to push back. Mm. Because what will never be what will happen. We have monotony. Um, yes. Okay, sorry, Roberts. Do you think that you can be a feminist without people's Yeah. Yeah. You spoke earlier about this kind of uh, reservoir and potential tsunami of, uh, say, women's rights in places like Iran, um, um, prison, or the certain the circumstances of Islam, certainly Islam, and the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And also, has this been also commented, for example, how, for example, the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages, one of the actual advantages it had was because it had the hierarchical structure which in some cases it doesn't have, it could control people who were um, radical or people who were the most, say, had the most insane ideas. And although it has been said that, for example, one of the ways that you could achieve more reform through Islam is precisely because it doesn't have this kind of structure, do you think it possibly, obviously, because you're highly critical of Islam, do you think that it actually could have the contrary effect because Islam is considered, it's not simply, so the Quran is not simply divinely inspired, but it's considered to be the final and perfect word of God. So it could actually have the opposite interpretation of having many of these groups, each of whom is, is convinced that they have the exact term of truth. Okay. Um, one last question. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I want to ask um, what, what help is needed right now? There's so many people interested in uh, the fight against extremism at the moment, um, whether they come from a religious background or not. Um, I should know there's probably quite a lot of people in this room who are studying right now that are thinking, yeah, like a career fighting extremism. Mm. So what's needed? What, what do you need right now? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, on your question, uh, of course I think you can be Muslim and feminist in the same way that I think you can be Catholic and pro-abortion, for example, or you can be um, a Buddhist and a secularist at the same time. Uh, because, um, I, as I explained, people live their religion in many different ways. There's, you know, um, they pick and choose, they decide what they like, what they don't like, and so you can definitely have people who are believers who are feminists uh, in the same way that you can also have atheists who are misogynists. I mean, I'm sure you know some atheists who are misogynists. Uh, you can have atheists who are homophobic. It, it's possible, yeah? And I think that's why they need to move away from this identity politics and only seeing people. Uh, and then these questions come up only because we, it, it's hard to imagine that people are human beings and they are as diverse as they are people. Uh, so, um, I would say for sure, and I work with many Muslim feminists. What I would say though, and I know there are some who won't agree with me, that there is no such thing as Islamic feminism. And uh, in the same way that there is no Catholic feminism or Buddhist feminism or Hindu feminism, because I think religion is fundamentally misogynist. And I have a huge problem with uh, well, let's not say that. I have a problem, not a huge problem. I have a problem with Islamic feminists who try to reinterpret the Quran to give it a more woman-friendly look. And the reason I have a problem with that is because I think that, you know, you have to decide where you're going to stand. Are you going to be a feminist or are you going to be is Islamic? You, I don't think you can do both in that sense because let me give you an example to be more clear. So you know the, the surah in the Quran, uh, Surah Al-Nisa, where it talks about uh, the fact that a man can beat his wife, but only after he's done several things like confine her and then told her off. And then in, in the last instance, he can beat her. And uh, Islamic feminists will say, well, this is a very good thing because in the past, uh, men would beat their wives indiscriminately, and now this is saying you've got to have several steps before you can beat the shit out of your wife, so that's great. And, but the second thing too is that you can beat the shit out of your wife, but you shouldn't break her bones, and make sure that you don't touch the face, because you need to look at it right afterwards. 
So, um, and then you have Islamic feminists who say, and you don't really need to use a very big, thick stick, you can use a light stick and just beat her lightly. What I'm saying is that, I'm sorry, but that's just, you know, for me it's just, uh, no, no, you're not gonna talk about women's rights in that way, I'm sorry. You know, we do live in the 21st century. You can think whatever rubbish you wanna think, that's fine, but don't you dare use these laws to then defend and justify the beating of women, which, by the way, Sharia courts in this country do all the time, relying on these things. So um, what I wanna say is that you know, Islamic feminism, for me, it doesn't go far enough. If you want to defend women's rights, well, there is a wealth of uh, progressive social political movements that have fought and died. People have fought and died for women's rights and equality. Rely on that. Why rely on ancient texts that are misogynist? So um, I, I will say this, though. I understand why though I don't agree with it. I understand why some women feel the need to do this, particularly if you're living, let's say, in Nigeria. You have a woman who's facing death by stoning. You've got to convince that judge, that Sharia judge in the north of Nigeria, that she shouldn't be sentenced. And the only way you can persuade him is by relying on the hadith and this. So I, I can understand that, but I will not tolerate it from anyone living here, I'm sorry. Don't even try it here. But there, I can understand it to some extent, and only because they might have no other choice. But if that same woman, that same uh, woman feminist judge, uh, sorry, lawyer, or campaigner comes out of that courtroom, and then comes and starts telling people that Islam recognizes women's rights, I think she shouldn't do that, because we all lose if religion has more of a say in the law or the state or the public space and the more that we can say that whatever you think it's your beliefs fine you have a right to it but it needs to be separate from the law and the state and the judicial system the better we will all be muslims and non-muslims and oh on the issue of sorry gosh i talked too long that was just the first question <laughs> i'm really sorry i don't know what's happened to me okay. um on the issue of uh, reform uh, yes, whether Islam, who asked me that? I can't even remember that yet. But <laughs> on the issue of reform and Islam, uh, I know Hay Ayan Hirshi Ali is pushing that line. Well, that's good at least, because, uh, I mean, she, she was uh, very much in bed with the neoconservatives for a long time. And don't get me wrong, I have a lot of respect for her uh, bravery and for her coming out and for the, her right to live and to speak as she chooses. But she was very much part of a neocon agenda where she was scapegoating and blaming Muslims and even there was a point where she had said, well, um, if a Muslim woman doesn't want to leave Islam, at least let her be Christian. Uh, why? Like, you know, she can't be an atheist like Ayan can, but she might, if she's going to leave, at least be a Christian, because that's a lot better. Well, well, now she's on to this whole Muslim reform thing, which is at least a step forward for her. Um, for me, though, I, I, I don't uh, buy into uh, Islamic Reformation. I think, uh, and I, I would agree with those who argue that ISIS is Islam's Reformation, because if you look at the history of uh, Reformation as well, it was a period where, uh, you know, of mass killings, of mass destruction, of destroying uh, artifacts, and using um, uh, also um, religious texts. And um, in fact, the rise of secularism in Europe is in response to this just disgust at the scale of violence uh, during the Reformation. So um, for me, I, I, I argue that we should have an enlightenment <coughs> against uh, Islam, an enlightenment that pushes it out of the public space. Um, but again, I think people are free to do as they want. If Muslims want to reform Islam, go ahead. You know, It's not my problem because I'm <coughs> not a, a Muslim now. And what, what, what I think, though, is that uh, what, what is important is that they're not part of the law or the state because that's where then no, nobody has any freedom to even criticize. You know, under ISIS, under the Islamic regime of Iran, even those uh, scholars who are religious scholars who accept an Islamic state, if they question anything, if they try to reform anything, they face execution or imprisonment. So when you do have a sort of Islamic position, it's impossible even for Muslim reformers to actually reform. Name one reformer that hasn't been threatened with death. 
from Britain, take the reformers in Britain, like Osama Hussein, <coughs> and you know, who's working now with the Quilliam Foundation, to, I don't know, reformers in Iran and, <coughs> and Egypt and so on and so forth. They're all under death threats, they're all um, facing persecution because it's impossible. They won't allow you to reform, they won't allow you to breathe. So to actually have any reform, we do need an enlightenment as well. So I think that's where, for me, what, what for me is key. That Islam doesn't have a hierarchical structure is irrelevant because it still does have power sources. And when they say it's not hierarch hierarchical, it's as if there are no power sources in Islam and everybody does whatever they want. No, not everybody has a knife uh, hanging over their heads very often. And uh, what help is needed? I mean, I think the best way to help is to support the dissenters, you know, because we are in a we are in a fight, and a lot of a lot of people, a lot of people who are meant to be our allies, on the left, feminists. I spoke for the first time at a feminist conference last week, my first ever invitation to a feminist conference, after all these years, and it's because so many feminists uh, prefer to stand with Islamism and ask and demand the respect for culture and religion. And, um, you know, so I think it's important to side with dissenters to highlight the protests that are taking place, whether it's for Farhunde in Afghanistan, the women's movement in Iran, whether it's the secularists in Baghdad who are coming out, and, and Iraq in their millions, to highlight that, to support that, and to support dissenters here in Britain as well, because we also face a lot of pressure in our fight against Sharia courts, in our fight against um, um, gender segregation at universities and the right to speak and criticize. So I think there's a lot to do. And I've got some leaflets here if you want to support any of the organizations I'm working with as well. Okay, talk so much. <coughs> yeah. You've spoken a lot about um, being on the left and how people often on the left you picked out Seamus Milne as well. <coughs> uh, about what's going on the left. Obviously, I mean, you picked out Seamus Milton. He's now an important figure in the Labour Party. So, what is your perception of what's happening with the British left at the moment and, and where it's heading? Questions? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that renouncing Islam is the way towards eradicating Islamism? Oh, okay. No, but okay. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Hi, uh, do you think it's possible that um, like minor cases of Muslim discrimination have been like um, like scandalised and politicised to like push an agenda or like give exposure to like certain individuals or, or groups? Uh, you can give some examples if you want. Uh, can you say that again? Minor cases of what? Muslim discrimination. Okay. <coughs> are, are there any minor cases of discrimination? Well, it's, well, it's my opinion, but there was okay. like, so there's two examples, both happened in America. There was one of the lady on the United Airlines oh, yeah, flight. yeah, with the Coke. Who was uh, refused the uh, unopened uh, kind of Diet Coke yes. by the uh, stewardess. Mm -hmm. And then there was, uh, I believe the boy's name was uh, Ahmed Mohammed, who uh, with the bought clock. a clock, had a bomb to um, Texas school. Uh, these stories, uh, once they hit social media, they absolutely exploded. Mm -hmm. And they got a lot of attention, like, you know, President Obama going forward for the case of the boy at the, the park and invited to the White House and um, I don't know with, with the case of the uh, woman on the United Airlines flight if you look into her background she was part of a, a Muslim organization mm -hmm. I don't know if it was a moderate one or an Islamist okay. one but um, not long after that story came out a story surfaced, surfaced from other passengers on that flight that said that completely contradicted her story saying that uh, she was just being really unreasonable, very confrontational, mm. and being like quite hysterical. Mm. Um, now, I don't know if that's BS. Mm. But... Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'll just start with you since we're. I mean, I, I don't think there's ever any minor case of discrimination. I think discrimination is serious. You know, you've got this group, um, Stop Islamization of Europe, which I hate. Uh, they've got this really stupid logo on their website which says um, Islamophobia. Oh, racism is the height of stupidity, but Islamophobia is the height of, uh, I don't know, rationality or something like that. And the fact that they just reduce racism, which is so humiliating, which is so dehumanizing, which is just so uh, intolerable into something that's just stupidity, you know. Um, 
in a sense, I think is part of the problem. I mean, I think we should be very vigilant against all forms of discrimination. Um, and, and I think we have, you know, even though I say that criticism of Islam and Islamism isn't discrimination against Muslims, discrimination against Muslims it exists, uh, as it does against migrants. To be honest, things are changing uh, a lot in Britain since this whole migrant crisis. And I myself have had quite a number of experiences of bigotry and racism that I find quite shocking and that I... Uh, that makes me think that um, I hope we're not going back to the time of the 70s when there was so much racism and discrimination. And when you hear about things that happened to, to black and minority people in this country, it was quite scary. Um, so I think even though you know, we, we should be able to criticize Islam and Islamism, we also need to be very wary of discrimination because it is a very serious thing. And it does, it does happen. I, I do agree that there will be cases that, go, that might become viral, that might not be um, you know, exactly what is being said happens. But that, again, doesn't mean that discrimination isn't real and that we shouldn't be challenging it. I mean, going back to what Keenan Malik says is that when we defend the right to free expression, uh, unconditional free expression, it gives us a moral duty to also stand up to bigotry and xenophobia and discrimination. And the reality is that, you know, um, for racists and xenophobes, uh, they can't distinguish any of us from anyone. You know, they'll, they'll attack a poor Sikh guy just thinking he's Muslim, you know. And, uh, you know, they'll say I'm practicing taqiyya just because I tell them don't scapegoat Muslims. Um, so I, I'm sure there are cases, I mean, that where people are using issues um, and Islamist organizations are using them. The one that, that comes to mind is of uh, uh, Shabina Begum, was that the young girl who wanted to wear a jilbab to school and um, the school refused. And um, she had an Islamist organization, for example, helping her. So, and, and you see that with Christian cases as well. You, you see you know, people who are fighting for, to wear the cross. Very often you've got some really psycho Christian right organization behind them paying for their court case and so on and so forth. But again, that doesn't mean discrimination isn't real and that we shouldn't be vigilant against it. Is that OK for you? Does that, yeah. Does that do it for you? Yeah. <laughs> um, what's, uh, what's happening to the British left? Who else? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I think you should just leave it to us, the Iranian left, the left from the Middle East and North Africa. We're going to save your British left. Yeah? <laughs> so don't worry about it. Yeah, we, 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 we're sorting them out step by step, and soon, I, and I think we are seeing a change uh, amongst people who consider themselves left, um, and uh, they are being challenged more and more, and I think, um, you know, something I said in the Guardian article that I insisted I have a right to reply to because the Guardian would never publish anything I say, um, but, you know, in that I said um, that it's time for us to reclaim the left um, and to make it the banner just uh, car carrier of social justice and equality and citizenship rights, all the things that the left always stood for historically. But now it just stands for Islamism, and it's just appalling. But don't worry. Basically, that's my, uh, my advice to you. <laughs> um, on the question of renouncing Islam to eradicating Islamism, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think I think Islamism is a political movement. You eradicate it politically. And so renouncing Islam is just one aspect of this fight against Islamism. Uh, but it also includes the fight against Sharia law, the fight against unveiling, for example, in Iran, um, the people who are fighting against male guardianship rules in Saudi Arabia. These are all various aspects of the fight. Um, the, the thing I will say about ex-Muslims coming out. I mean, to be honest, I don't even like that term because I've been atheist for a very long time. I never called myself an ex-Muslim. Um, but it is a term that does provoke, yes, and we like doing that, and inflame. Uh, it, it's, it's provocative, you know, and particularly because um, it's a way of challenging a movement that tells you you will die if you, uh, if you leave or if you question. Uh, so the example we often give is it's like gays coming out of the closet. It doesn't, it's your business if you're gay or straight or whatever. 
Um, but when you are being discriminated against, when you're being hounded, then you come out and say, I'm gay, I'm proud, or I'm black and I'm proud. All the various things we've heard over time in, in various movements for people's liberation. And so also, I think with ex-Muslims, it's that same idea that, you know, I'm ex-Muslim and out. And um, to be honest, when we started the Council of Ex-Muslims eight years ago, 2007, uh, no one wanted to show their names and their faces. It was only us damn Iranians, you know? We just, because we're, we're used to just uh, fight, we, you know, because of our experience and history fighting the Iranian regime for now more than 35 years. Um, so it was, it's all pictures. If you look at this initial thing that we have, it's all Iranian exiles. Um, but now uh, we're a minority because it's mainly, um, you know, ex-Muslims from Britain, uh, so mainly from Pakistani, um, Indian backgrounds, Asian backgrounds, who are uh, the most uh, prominent in our group. And it, it comes, uh, we had a, um, I'll tell you the story, we had a conference in 2008 on ex-Muslims, and all the ex-Muslims were hiding upstairs because they didn't want to be filmed or seen. And now, everywhere I go, people come up to me and say, I'm ex-Muslim. There are groups starting that don't even know who I am. I'm appalled, you know, <laughs> and that I don't know who they are. And that just shows that what, what a lot of space has opened up in just eight years. That is a lot of space, a lot of space. And it just sh goes to show what can be done when you do push boundaries and when you do challenge things. It lets people, it gives people the sense that they can do it too and it allows people to come out of hiding. So from that perspective, I think it's an important challenge to Islamism and to Islam, uh, though not the only one. Oh my God. I'm okay, time. that's one last question. Okay. Just one. <coughs> my voice yeah, is coming. Kind of oh, I see it. Um, yeah. Hi there. Um, yeah, on, on the subject of speakers. Don't ask a difficult question, you'll be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> On the subject of speakers, there seems to be uh, speakers like Yusuf al Qadawi, mm. Khalid Yassin, um, they can get on and say things like suicide bombing as well as justified because it's a militarized um, society. And this doesn't seem to be on the fringes, this seems to be fairly mainstream. Uh, is this unique to Islam and what, why is it like this? Are you saying the Islamists are mainstream or the position is mainstream? The, the, the speakers have a sizable. <coughs> I don't think you would find that in the Church of England. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, again, I mean, it, it goes to my point uh, about the fact that why I feel, uh, you know, Islam and Islamism is a special case, not because it's any different from other religions or religious right movements, and I gave examples of the Buddhist right, the Christian right, the Hindu right, the Jewish right, but because of the extent of power that it has, you know, so in, in that sense, it is more dangerous to us than, let's say, um, for now, Britain first or the EDL for now, because of the level of power that they have. So um, in that sense, um, it, it's more dangerous, but also because this is a, not a fringe movement, it is a political, a global political movement with state power and backing, that um, what is that Islamists are sold as the dominant norm. Uh, you know, this is they speak for all Muslims. They speak for the Islamic world. They speak for the Muslim communities, and therefore they're the ones that are given the red carpet treatment. And we, none of us, whether we're ex-Muslims, whether we're Muslim feminists or Muslim secularists, we are not authentic, and therefore we one, hardly get invited to many places unless we just try to push our way in, uh, as you can see I did here, or, um, or um, y you know, you're, you're accused of certain things. And so I think, you know, that's why it's so important to be able to defend, that f that's why free expression is so important, because it helps us with the only mechanism in a way that we have to challenge those in power. And Islamists are our fascists, there are theocracies, you know, and it's, it's offensive in a sense to all those people who have died from Egypt to Algeria to Iran to wherever, who fought dying, uh, who've died fighting this movement, who are in prison today, 
uh, because of their oppo opposing to, uh, opposition to this movement, who have fled and are the masses fleeing this movement, who voted with their very feet against it, that they are seen to be our representatives. I mean, what could be more offensive than that, seriously? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.